I'd now like to invite our keynote speaker to the stage, Jean Rodriguez. Jean is a South Bay resident, was recently confirmed by the U.S. Senate to serve as the Assistant Secretary for Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy and is a nationally recognized expert in clean energy policies and programs. Jean, I know you relocated to Washington, D.C., so thank you so much for coming back home to the South Bay and joining us here in person. I, I want to thank you first, John, for that kind introduction, obviously written by my mom, because you, you left out all the bad stuff about me. I, I, I also want to say uh, hello to everyone. Hi. And, and I want to say hello first, because I want to warn you about what I'm about to subject you to. Today's talk will not just be a talk. I know I'm from the federal government, so you expect me to come up here and just blah, 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 blah at you. But instead, I want to spark a conversation. Does that sound fair with you? Yes. So this is what I'm going to do. I am standing between you and lunch, and I was hiding over in the corner, <laughs> peeking in. It looks like it's pretty darn good, so I promise to keep us on time. I promised Jackie I would make my remarks short and sweet, which my wife Becky, who's sitting over there, knows I never, ever, ever do when I'm talking with her. So what I'm going to do is try to make sure that I provide you with just a little something at the, outside, uh, at the outset that provides you with some context for today's discussion. Because as I sit here, it's my tremendous honor to be looking out at this room and you see the local elected officials, to see the other people who are policymakers and legislators, to see the folks who are serving the public in, in, in ways that are part of their job, and so many of you who are members of the public who've made it your role to look beyond just yourself and to serve your fellow uh, citizen. So I want, I want, to honor your presence as those folks who are looking out for the, the economic prosperity, the quality of life here in the South Bay by bringing you in a little bit and maybe giving you a little context. But before I do that, before I do that, I wanted to thank one other person for my attendance here today, and that's Jackie Backrack. Let's give Jackie a hand. You guys all know her as your capable and competent uh, executive director of, of this uh, organization. But I happen to know her as a colleague, a friend, and a pretty swell human being. So, so Jackie, thank you for having me here. The fact that I've had the opportunity to embarrass you now means I can jump right in. And, 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 and uh, I'm going to fall prey to the, ca to the uh, stereotype of uh, the shallow, vapid, superficial uh, Southern California dude uh, who, who says, enough about you, let's talk about me. I, I, I'm gonna make you suffer through a little bit about me because I think it, it provides you with perspective as to where I'm coming from when I make my comments today and when I encourage you and engage you in a conversation later on. So, so my first perspective, what is it? My per first perspective uh, is this. The fact that I showed up today uh, with a suit, a clip-on tie, and some pretty uncomfortable shoes tells you I must be here in my official capacity uh, as Assistant Secretary of Energy for the Office of Electricity at the Department of Energy. Well, that's pretty important to me because I have the profound privilege of leading the Office of Electricity, which focuses its energy, its intellect, its efforts on the technological, the behavioral, the analytical, the programmatic, and the systematic advancements necessary to serve as the foundation for a 21st century American grid. Now, I know that when you hear the phrase 21st century American grid, it sounds like one of those puff phrases, right? It sounds pretty important, but it doesn't have a lot of meaning. 
But I, I want to tell you something. I want you to recognize something that is tremendously important uh, for this conversation. The phrase 21st century American grid is a telling uh, characterization because that's not the foundation we're building on. As you look around at the, the, the network of poles and wires and transformers and devices that are out there right now, you must recognize that just like me, a lot of this was built out. Southern California was built out in kind of the baby boomer era. So that meant, as we were talking about earlier this morning, it's built on 19th century engineering principles using 20th century technologies that were available at the time. So it is a mighty effort to do what we call modernizing the American grid. It is not a simple thing. It is not a bolt-on type of fix. It is something that's going to take uh, not just near-term action, but a longer-term vision. And the folks I work with, the folks I have the honor and privilege of working side-by-side -side with in the Office of Electricity, our job is to help be a catalyst for that change. But this is not a situation in which the federal government's going to parachute in and rescue us from some, some terrible outcome in the future. And it's not a situation where we can look at our utilities and say, get her done, because it doesn't work like that. What's going to have to happen is that we're going to have to, to, to find ways to work together to modernize the grid. And as we think about what that means, I come to you with five overarching priorities of my office. Number one, and I think you've heard that, you, you, well, you've seen it here in the title of today's uh, convening. You've seen it and heard it from the panel uh, that we just heard from. You're going to hear it in the next panel on the power sector. But number one is reliability and resilience. Now, I've been a lot of things that nobody ever wants to invite to a cocktail party in, in my life. I was an English teacher. Who wants to tell me what a gerund is? I, uh, well, I won't ask you that, but I will beg you to listen to me as I give just a little bit of vocabulary lesson for the gene vocabulary, what I mean by uh, reliability and resilience. Reliability is simply this. When you go home at night, and you flip the switch, the lights go on. Now, we don't think about that. But if you were to look at, and, and, and uh, again, like the kid who would rather do a, an, an engineering tour than go to Disneyland, I, I would not recommend that you do that. But, it, but if, if you were to actually sit down and figure out what it takes to get electrons from where they're produced, through a network, to your home, to power the lives we lead. It's, it's a modern engineering miracle. And the miracle must evolve because the miracle that we have today is not good enough for the lifestyles we need to lead, for the actions we need to take, for the increasing complexity of the electric system that we have, to capture the opportunities out there, but also to ward off the threats. There is a lot that needs to happen to make reliability a thing, to flick a switch and a light comes on. So then what is resilience? Well, in gene speak, resilience is being able to get the grid and get the power supply back up to full speed when the unthinkable happens, when you flick the switch and the power doesn't come on. And that is a challenge that is becoming more and more and more and more a reality in our everyday lives, right? It's, it's no longer something that engineers think about. Every time you pick up the newspaper, you, you hear about yet another extreme weather event. What we used to call one in a hundred year events seems to be happening with alarming frequency and with a pervasiveness in every corner of the country. Who would have thought, who would have thought that the Northeast, 
that is used to cold weather could have its power system crippled by a cold snap. Who would have thought folks in Texas would be losing their lives and having their livelihoods ruined by a cold snap that created a freeze that challenged the reliability of the system in the state of Texas? Who would have thought, and I love the phrase from the last panel, this kind of whiplash weather events, who would have thought that last year as we were all focused on the lack, the lack of water California has received and what that meant, not just in terms of water conservation, but in energy reliability, in creating kindling conditions that th make wildfires not just a threat, but a reality on a year by year by year basis, time and time and time again. And now we're faced with the devastation of too much rain all at once at the wrong places. So reliability, resilience, that's job one. And, and I, let me share a, just a, a little bit of a story with you about why I think that that's important. We know we live in politically charged times. And goodness knows I got a primer on it uh, by being nominated by the president uh, to serve in the role I, I have the honor to serve in now and, and going through the process of a Senate confirmation and meeting with people who have very different ideas than me and meeting with some people who think exactly like I do. Uh, they just do it in a different context, a different framework. But I will tell you, I got through. I, when I walked the halls in D.C., I, a, a lot of people kind of look at me. Kind of, you can always tell, corner of the eye look kind of thing. And at first I thought it was because I'm in D.C. and I wear snazzy socks. Because <laughs> I'm a Californian, huh? and I'm not going to go there without having a little style. <laughs> but it's not that. It's that I got through the process, the nomination to confirmation process, in what felt like record time to so many in the building. And, and I think I know why. It's that's because no matter what the energy policies, no, what the political, no matter what the political affiliations were of each and every senator I met, there was one thing about which all, we all agreed on, and that is the critical importance of reliability of energy supply to the American people. So that's thing number one. Got four more. <laughs> number two. We must enable the seamless integration of all resources available on the grid. Let me tell you something I'm extremely, I brag about constantly as a Californian in DC. And that is, I believe, now strike that, I know California has done a better job of creating a vast potential of what we call grid edge resources but it really means all of you, the devices in your home, your, your ability and willingness to take actions on an individual basis, which collectively makes a huge difference. Utilities that have programs that not just encourage, but reward uh, uh, the kinds of behaviors that are good, not just for the grid, but for their neighbors and for their fellow citizens. We've created a vast, vast, vast potential now, my new job is to quit celebrating the potential and help figure out the technological, the behavioral, the system uh, uh, approaches that allow us to tap into that vast resource in ways that are truly transformational, in ways that help to make sure that all that available energy and conservation megawatts as, as we talk about it in our, our industry, can be put to productive use on any given day at any given time to solve all kinds of problems. And not just keeping the lights on, but ensuring that it's affordable. And not just making it uh, sure it's affordable for every citizen of the South Bay, but ensuring uh, the reliability of the system in all kinds of conditions. So priority number two, let's make this vast potential used and useful. Now the utility people sitting at this table are gonna groan. They go, that's, 
used and useful is one of those regulatory phrases uh, that's part of how you uh, uh, look at whether or not an asset can be productively put into rate base because it has to be used and it has to be useful in the provision of electric service. But I think of that phrase in a much broader sense and I'm going to encourage all of us to think about it differently as well. Because, well, let me ask you this question. What makes a gathering like this more than merely interesting? What makes it important? I think I know the answer. If all we do is walk away from here a little smarter, then that was an interesting afternoon. But if we find ways to take what we learn, if we find ways to take the fact that we have this gathering here together and bring action out of it, that's what makes it important. Because all that really matters is the change we make in the world. All that really matters is not what we think and not even what we do, is the impact we have on the planet and the people we have the honor of serving. Uh, thank you for that, thank you for that, but uh, I didn't share a pearl of wisdom. Save the applause for pearls of wisdom. They're gonna come from the next panel. That was just common sense. It's something that we all agree with because we all know it to be true. And what I wanna challenge us to do today is to find ways to take that action and do it in a collective fashion so that it's not just impactful, it becomes transformational. So now, let's jump to priority number three. I'll give this very short trip because I wanna save time for conversation uh, at the end of my talk here. Uh, and that is in my office, we work on the technological end of things. And, and uh, uh, trust me when I tell you this, uh, I have this stable of racehorses. They're, they're pseudo geniuses and many of them clean up nice. You would even invite them into your home or to your cocktail party. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, but they all share one thing, and it's a commitment to capturing the best of American ingenuity and translating it into things that can be invested on, in at scale in every local government, every regional uh, transmission grid operator, every utility around the country to modernize the American grid. And four is focusing on not just the technological, but climate, jobs, justice. And what that's really about is the impact of technology is cool for a technologist, but when it's applied appropriately and it helps us to cope with climate change. So much of the discussion we had today and is a necessary discussion in the near term especially, is about adaptation. Adaptation is how we cope with the situation where we're in now. And that's critically important because what's the first rule of digging holes? Quit digging, right? Let's not make it worse, that's adaptation. But I've got another rule. I'm an old boy scout. I was senior patrol leader of my scout troop. You didn't know that, did you, Bob? And that is, the, what is the first rule if your canoe springs a leak in the middle of a lake? It's, yeah, that's exactly right. It's not just tread water, because eventually you're going to get tired and go under. It's paddle to shore. So what we must be thinking about, and what my team is working on, is not just cool technology, but technology that will allow us to get ahead of the curve on some of these challenges we're facing, on reliability and res resilience, on security, and create a grid that helps us to not just address problems and fend them off, but to also get us beyond the difficulty so that we can capture the opportunity. 
And then last but not least, I'll just mention this briefly in, in my department, uh, and it's probably less useful to today's discussion, but, but it's something you need to uh, recognize to understand the complexity of the problems we face, uh, the challenges we have, and the opportunities we have to capture. And, and that is, everything we do in terms of modernizing America's grid, and I, I, I will say this goes for the water systems as well, everything must be secure and safe. Because we live in a world where the threats, both man-made from malicious actors and uh, from weather, natural, we must build a grid that doesn't require Band-Aid fixes constantly to ward off. We must build a system that's secure, not by accident or happenstance or the fact that people are ignorant of the vulnerabilities, but that are secure from ground one because it's built in. So that's perspective one. That's the Office of Electricity. Perspective two is shorter. I'm standing here in front of you as a person who has now 33 years and counting of experience in the clean energy space. Now I want to I want to point out our table of the youth leaders, the youth thought leaders who you'll be hearing from later on today. I want to I want to tell you right now, don't run for the exits. This isn't going to be an okay boomer moment. I'm not going to stand on my figurative front yard and shake my tiny fist at you and yell, "Get off my lawn, you young whippersnappers with your wild ideas." No, instead, instead I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to make a rule, not for your table, but for every other table in here. You're going to have an opportunity to hear from these young people later today. And right now, I want everyone at this table to know that anybody who goes up to them and says, you are the future, must give them a dollar. And here is why. Because you are the future isn't an observation of, of what they represent. It's a cop-out. And the cop-out is this. We, collectively, are the future. We must be the ones to bridge the generation gap and not just listen to them and giving a polite applause and they get more than one clap at the end of their talk. But we should be involving them today in thinking about what it is that we need to serve the people that are the citizens of today and the citizens of tomorrow. We, collectively, need to be working together to be thinking not in terms of what can my utility do for you, but instead, how can I work with my utility to be part of their planning process, to be part of their investment process. More importantly, to be part of their envisioning process for what the world should look like tomorrow, what the energy system, which is at the heart of everything we do. Can you, can you imagine, this sounds like one of those twilight zones, right? You wake up tomorrow and there is no energy grid. What happens? to the global economy, what happens to your ability to use your credit card to get uh, a cheeseburger, double cheeseburger? <laughs> what, happens, what happens to your health, safety, and comfort? What happens to the ability of the, the folks who are charged with protecting us, their ability to fulfill their mission? What happens to your ability to communicate with friends and family? What happens to your ability to feed your family. The uh, energy system is too important, I'll say that again, is too gosh darn important to leave in the hands of just the folks in the utilities or to leave in the hands of just the folks who are your local electeds. You, in whatever capacity you have, should be part of envisioning that future and that's gonna take working together and, and, and the, third, the third perspective is just this, and it'll lead me right into kind of the part where I get to give my strongly held opinions and you have to listen to them because you're my captive audience. <laughs> the third perspective is this. I, I, there was false advertising to get you here. Uh, you, you, I'm looking at it on the screen right now. Gene Rodriguez, 
Assistant Secretary for Energy, Office of Electricity, U.S. Department. That's not why I came here. I came here because I'm Jean Rodriguez. My wife and I are 30-year residents of the South Bay. I'm a citizen who wants to help preserve the quality of life and all the things we have that make me proud to tell my colleagues in D.C., well, you know, right now it's sunny, it's warm, and Brad Pitt is mowing my lawn because in, in Southern California, movie stars can come and mow your lawns for you. <laughs> Don't tell them that's a lie because it really makes them jealous. So I want to give you, I want to give you now uh, my comments, and then I'm going to open myself up for cross-examination and for conversation because that's going to be the point of today's talk. Working hypothesis number one, and, and, and I'm going to ask this of you. Is there anyone in this room who is not yet convinced that the reliability and the resilience of America's electric grid is one of the most critical things to our well-being today, tomorrow, and into the future. Anybody? Stand up. Don't be shy. Stand up if you believe that's wrong, because that way we can all throw rocks at you and call you a Luddite. OK. So working hypothesis number one is the, that we recognize the importance of the electric system. So that must necessarily mean that we are all going to own that we have a responsibility to ourselves, to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, and people we don't even know, to help figure out what the right path forward is. Grid modernization should no longer be thought of as how much money does it take to invest in the grid. Grid modernization should be thought of as what is the life we want to preserve? What is the life we want to lead? And I know there might be many, many differing opinions in here, but I will, I will tell you that I think uh, we will find that there's a great deal more commonality in, in what we want for the future, for our citizens, for ourselves, than there are differences. My second hypothesis is this. I, I, I don't know if you guys, well, you guys won't, pipsqueaks, youngsters. But ba back in the day, there used to be uh, uh, the TV show, I can't remember, it was Sheriff John or whatever, what, whatever his name was. When I was a kid, the only thing I wanted in the world was to get one of those Sheriff John badges to wear. Because that would make me part of the Sheriff John uh, army out there. That would make me a public servant. But what I didn't know as a kid, what I didn't realize is public service isn't about the job you have. It isn't whether or not you're sworn into office or you wear a uniform or, or uh, you face election. Public service is the obligation that each and every one of us has as a, a productive citizen in the communities in which we live. Because if you aren't helping to serve the whole, the public, then you're just a taker. And that makes you a bad, rotten person, and your mom would be ashamed of you. <laughs> so, so, so hypothesis number two, is there anyone in this room who does not recognize that despite the fact that not all of us are elected or, 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 or have to go through uh, a, 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 a hearing in front of the Senate or, or, or get, get up in the morning and wear a badge, we're public servants. Do you agree? Are we public servants? Yes. Yeah. OK. Hypothesis two, done. <laughs> Hypothesis three. Now, this is, this, is, this is kind of a mean. I'm going to reveal the mean and nasty part of me now. One of my favorite things, to, I, I, I continue, even though I'm old and creaky and my vertical leap's about that high and I never had much athleticism, I still like to play beach volleyball and go out with my other old friends. And, and we try to relive our glory days, but it's really embarrassing and humiliating. But, but the only thing that makes me feel better about myself is when I see tourists who aren't Californians go out into the ocean 
And then a wave starts to come their way. And what do they do? As if these, these ten phalanges can hold back the power uh, of the, and the majesty of a giant wave. Well, we see that happening, no. We see that happening in kind of intellectual ways all the time. We see people out there who fail to recognize that we're in the midst of a global transition to a clean energy economy. It's not happening because of a policy decision that's being made in any one office or any one country. It's not being happening because someone gave a speech. It's happening because that is the march of ine inevitability. Boy, that was a tough one to get out. That is where the globe, the world, and every nation is headed. So I posit to you that the nation that leads the transition to the clean energy economy will be the nation that benefits from it the most in terms of energy security, in terms of being the powerhouse, not just intellectually, but in terms of geopolitical uh, strife and, and, or lack thereof. We, as Americans, must make American ingenuity, American factories, American manufacturing, American workers, the drivers of the clean energy economy as it comes through the world. Number two, powerfully held opinion number two. We need to develop a 21st century power grid. I'm not going to go on and on and on about it. Just, just, just think about this. Our power system has become more than a giant central station plant somewhere, giant transmission, uh, smaller distribution, and then a plug and an outlet in our house. It's become this increasingly complex network in which decisions are being made at the speed of light. An increasingly complex network in which the, the, the power that's being supplied are no longer being generated by these muscular machines with all this inertia built up in giant flywheels, but actually little things on our roof that produce power when the, when the sun is shining and, and click off when it's not. This is a complex system. We need a grid to, to manage it, and it is the job of all of us to ensure we have that grid. And then my last thought is this, and it might be the only controversial one I have, but, but listen to me for a moment, and I think you'll, you'll recognize that it's true. There is no way, no how, just like the tourists standing there in front of the wave, that any of us can escape the effects of climate change. So climate change does require adaptation in the near term. But more importantly, it requires us to lean in on finding ways to get ahead of the curve so that we preserve the quality of life and enhance the quality of life for all of us. So closing, I will make my final demand. And, I, and I'll actually uh, uh, use a quote from somebody else that I used to. I used to have this little quote on my desk uh, years and years ago. And, and now that I'm older and I looked at it for a while, I, I think it was probably uh, a little too much too much, a, a little bit overly generalized, a little bit over the top. But, but I think there's a lot of truth in it. And it was a quote from, attributed it to, to General Colin Powell. And it said, Organization really doesn't accomplish anything. Plans don't accomplish anything either. Theories of management, they don't much matter. Endeavors succeed or fail because of the people involved. Only by attracting the best people will you accomplish great things. So here's my challenge to us today. Right now, don't look at me. Look around the room. You're still looking at me. Look around the room. <laughs> what you see are the best people. What we must do to make this day more than interesting, more than important, but perhaps on the path all the way to transformational, is to recognize that the people in this room, and not just the ones you know, the people in this room are who you need to work with, you need to listen to, you need to cooperate with, you need to collaborate with 
to design and live in a 21st American future that is beneficial to all of us in this room and everyone around the country. And so with that challenge in place, I will end my comments and open myself up for, I think we have five minutes or so, for about five minutes of Q&A. And don't be nice to me because uh, then my wife will just think you're sucking up. So just, <laughs> first question, I think let's get a microphone over here. There's questions over here. Whoever gets the microphone first, say who you are, where you're from, and, and ask your question. Thank you. My name is Janice Lynn. I'm the founder and president of the Green Hydrogen Coalition. Thank you. That was probably the best keynote speech I've ever heard. Thank you for the inspiration. My question was... I'm, Wait, I'm, one second, Janice. You see, Becky, I told you I have a real job. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, and I agree with everything you said, I'm curious if you should shed more light on how your office is collaborating with the other offices oh. in DOE on uh, reliability, resiliency, uh, especially, especially because what we're facing now is a convergence. We heard a lot about water, there's the gas yeah. sector, there's transportation, the grid's so important to it all. No, that, that, that is an absolutely wonderful question. So uh, let, me, let me give it an answer in three quick sound bites. Number one, it comes from the top. Uh, within the Biden-Harris administration, and especially from Secretary Granholm, what we hear each and every day is our job is to work together on behalf of the American people. So I have the, uh, the honor and the privilege to lead a couple, uh, not just cross DOE collaborations, but cross the entirety of the administration, because the, the, the work we're talking about involves the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce, uh, uh, the manufacturing sector. So it isn't just collaboration within government, but it's also bringing all the key stakeholders to the table in real time. You know what the worst thing in the world anyone could do, and, and I think it happens probably all too often, is this. Look what I made. Do you think it'll work? That is the wrong way to design anything. You bring the stakeholders into the room. You bring the necessary collaborators in the room. So th that's kind of a, a glib and short way, but I want to get to other questions as well. But, but it comes from the top and it has to be part of the culture, and that's the way it's happening in this administration. Thank you, Gene. My name is Jim Deere, a city councilman in the city of Carson, and welcome to Carson, and welcome back Thank to you. the South Bay. We appreciate your talk. At the very beginning, you mentioned that we were operating the current grid across the United States as uh, something from 19th century engineering, 20th century uh, technology. And so my question is, uh, can you outline to us, maybe in layman's terms, what uh, the future of the grid is? What will it look like? Are you talking about alternative technology? Are you talking about maglev trains? Uh, future technology hasn't been invented yet. Maybe some people sitting behind me are going to invent something that hasn't, doesn't even exist today. Uh, can you tell us what does a, you, uh, when you said it, I thought, oh, I want to know what it looks like. The, so wonderful. can you tell us what you think it looks like? Thank you. I, I, I absolutely, absolutely will. And first, let me give my, this caveat. I'm an old attorney, so I, I love giving caveats as well. Anybody who gives you if you invite a, Jackie, if you invite a futurist here to give you a picture of this is the future, I want you to shout them out of the room because the only thing that's true about any futurist forecast is that it's always wrong, but it's often directionally correct. So the work we do in my office and throughout the, the Department of Energy is not to pick winners and losers for what that grid of the future looks like but it's to find ways to enable the marketplace to come up with the ideas, to come up with the solution paths, et cetera, that can, that can be part of it. So then let me get to my, my picture of the future. The, my picture of the future is actually part of the unrealized potential of today. So as I said, uh, I started out on grid edge resources. On that end of the scale, I want every home and every business not just to be called on when we want to keep the lights on and there's been a tremendous heat storm in California, et cetera. 
I want us to all economically, and for good citizen purposes, to be part of a, a, a constantly fluctuating, flexible grid that is taking power flows, taking control, not taking control, but using the ability to control where allowed to, uh, power consumption, in ways that balance things so things becomes, become much, much more efficient. Let me, let me just say this one thing. You know what's wrong with 19th century engineering? You say, 20 years from now, how much load do I think is gonna be out there? And you build for that load. Now number one, what has happened in this last 20 years? If you look at, if you look in our garage, you see my wife's electric vehicle. And if you look down the street, you'll see, well, EVs are the new station wagon of the South Bay. This grid wasn't designed for that kind of impact. You can't forecast that future, so we need to design a grid that is flexible. And when that comes place, we enable any energy future we want. And uh, let me say this one last thing uh, about that. One of the great things about our country is that the energy future of the South Bay of Southern California, of California, is gonna be different than the energy future of you pick another state. So the grid, the American grid, must be able to facilitate our future as well as it facilitates theirs. It's not a visual, but I think it's a good principle to think about. Hello. Oh, wait. I, I, I think we're giving this side of room a chance. Yes, my name is Johnny, and I'm a Carson resident. And I just wanted to know how well are our grids protected from attack? Because we know if the grids go down, we're in trouble. So how well are they protected? So no, that, that's a wonderful question. So with, with, uh, within uh, what used to be within the Office of Electricity, now we kind of split it off so it, its own uh, 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 group of people who are focused 100%, 24-7, 365 on the issue. Uh, of, of ensuring that the grid, remember my uh, uh, difference between reliability and resilience? Uh, we're attacking it, that issue in that way because the, the one thing that's just, just horrifying to me, it's not just that we have more and more of these extreme weather events, it's we have people in the guise of patriotism who are trying to ruin the grid that is, that is so vital to the lives and livelihoods of, of their fellow American citizens. So your question is, uh, how protected is it? How, how secure is it? Uh, uh, good enough for right now. So, th so what, what does that mean? What does that mean? I'm putting, it, I'm putting this in context. What you have not seen, what you have not seen and you will not see in the near term is the ability of anybody to take down the grid uh, with high-powered rifles shooting up uh, infrastructure. You have not seen uh, with any tremendous success the ability of cyber actors to cripple large parts of our grid. But what we have seen are people trying it. And what we have seen, people evolving how, they, how sophisticated their attacks are. When I talk about making sure security is built into the grid, that's the longer term view of it. So we've got folks right now whose job it is to identify threats and ward them off on a real time basis. That's the keeping your head above water. But what we also have are teams of people working in my shop who are focused on how do we make the grid more impenetrable, less able to have physical uh, threats, whether they be from near to wells or, or, or from extreme weather. So is it, uh, this is one of those things that anybody who says mission accomplished, we're done, uh, they're lying to you. Good enough for today is as good as it gets right now, but we need to work it every single day from both aspects, near-term threats, long-term uh, uh, conditional threats. And, I think, I think I've used up all our time, and the chicken is going to be delicious, I think. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. <laughs>